For some years, I used to carry around <coughs> an issue of the AAA's general anthropology, not the kind of thing I regularly have under my arm, not like AT, of course. But it had a startling message I didn't know how to think about. This was from a study of the way students discuss controversial issues, and the startling message was that tolerance is an obstacle to discussion. The author was commenting on the general assumption that people need to feel safe in order to discuss freely. A typical situation is the open microphone passed around where everyone speaks their mind, no one's going to be challenged for their beliefs, differences of opinion are regarded as resolvable by understanding, and some positive value has to be seen in every view, and people are expected when they talk to be expressing views that belong to them. Everyone involved, an agent. If this is tolerance, how can it be an obstacle? There are echoes here of what has been called a recognition space in the interaction of Australian and Aboriginal law. Limited as this space is, it refers to an arena where Australian law is prepared to recognise Aboriginal claims to land. Now, the recognition space is distinguished from substantive Indigenous understandings. It simply acknowledges that there can be an administrative assessment of such claims on the part of the Australian courts without them having to see anything larger. It does not endorse the reasoning or the rationale of Aboriginal law, only the admissibility of the claims. But it's not because of its narrowness that an anthropologist reporting on Australian recognition spaces is uneasy. So what is the source of the unease? Recognition space already implies, Rina argues, the notion of a culture as an object occupying a domain. The recognition space becomes a creative afterthought to what already exists, a means of communication across a divide. And Wiener observes that ontologically, his term, one cannot distinguish between a difference that emerges within a culture as opposed to a difference that emerges between. Why not start, he says, with one world, wherein people's languages and more or less well-understood laws contingently and practically exist, and because it is our subject matter, the differentiating activity that emerges and results in such categories as indigenous and non-indigenous. As to the problem of tolerance, the unease here is because everyone talks and nothing is argued. The classroom muffles conflict, diffracting opposed interests and turning them into so many points of view. Now remember that the context is pedagogic. While you can hold a point of view, you cannot argue from one. In order to argue, you need to have detached yourself from, divided yourself off from, competing positions that you might otherwise have occupied. We might say that division is the essence of argument. Tolerance embodied in the roving microphone is no tolerance at all if there's nothing to see. Now, different, different as these cases are, in neither does the substance of people's positions have to be conveyed. Substance is all in the very different kind of encounter that Eric Hirsch draws from Gallison's notion of trading zones, and I'm going to quote. What happens when an H-bomb designer, a logician, an aerodynamical engineer, and a statistician sit down together? Whatever else they do, they do not found a League of Nations with simultaneous translators. No, they work out an intermediate language, a pigeon, that serves a local mediating capacity. Now, where a simultaneous translation creates value in the speakers, whether through techno-legal instruments of recognition or through an ethos of tolerance, trade pigeon finds value in the objects of transaction defined by their usefulness or their utility in communicating. In fact, the notion of practical people getting on with work, rolling up their shirt sleeves to keep with the 1950s imagery, and above all, being inventive about their means of collaboration is all too compelling. It's spontaneous, people's actions are governed by the problem they have to hand, they don't stand in ceremony, they get down to business. But I want to suggest that this second down-to-earth transactional paradigm is quite as problematic as the roving microphone and technical spaces for recognition, and we should be quite as uneasy. Now, one wouldn't want to diminish value of tolerance or deny legal openness. 
The issue is the way in which their management suppresses or displaces division. And the same has become true of the honest trade of collaboration. Trading zones really ought to be micromanaged. The last couple of decades have seen, not least on the part of the UK government, increasingly explicit <coughs> moves to cre create arenas for spontaneous synergy, to generate innovation out of boundary crossing, and if we bring the example home to higher education, to do so in the name of knowledge. Creativity itself is seen to lie in the ability to combine elements from many sources to the benefit of business and education alike. Trading zones, now signs of the creative, not robust enough to be left alone, must be actively encouraged. I'm going to suggest that social anthropology is particularly well placed to assess some of the implications <coughs> of such micromanagement. I contrast a managerial model of knowledge creation with a research model. And here anthropology, anthropology is located in a field of disciplines, and that's where Huxley will come in. I also want to draw on material quite specific to social anthropology in order to point to some of the capacities for human interaction engaged in these processes, but not confined to them, and sketch in just why anthropologists might want to think of themselves as a community of critics. of it, the so-called knowledge economy seems to be made for research. Evidence-based medicine, evidence-based policy making, goes hand, go hand in hand with an understanding of the world as full of uncertainties. These uncertainties are not just political or economic, they're epistemological. Researchers, of course, know that the more they apply knowledge, the more problems proliferate, especially through the engine of technology which turns scientific knowledge into useful products. But the point is, we suddenly don't know how useful they might be, or even how we should know that, what ethical or social consequences might lie ahead. Research itself is an engine for turning uncertainties into epistemological ones, seeing gaps in information, creating a premises of doubt on which knowledge seeking rests. Knowledge is, of course, a condition of human existence. But in further basing knowledge on information and thereby producing the knowledge economy, we produce a sense that it can be regulated. Consider, for instance, the contemporary relationship between research that comes out of universities and society. <coughs> it's particularly scientific research that is targeted, partly because of the massive nature of public funding, partly because of its potential for far-reaching practical consequences, to which is added the need to purvey information, make it useful, have it inform policy. In other words, there is a new arena concerned with making the flow and consumption of knowledge productive. Now, in many areas that science has opened up, it would be regarded as trivial to be interested in ethical or social implications for their own sake. On the contrary, such implications are usually investigated in order to turn them into normative precepts understandings by which to act or give advice. For one of the most important axioms of the knowledge economy is that action must be predicated on information, more generally that knowledge is worthwhile to the extent that it can be used. And this is where management comes in. The fourth annual conference on knowledge management for the public sector held in September promised three things. Unlocking your greatest, your greatest asset, meeting key targets, and working collaboratively. The knowledge economy that's made for research is also made for management. Let me quote from their brochure. The public sector represents the biggest single resource for the creation of value-added information, content, and services. And yet knowledge management often falls by the wayside, displaced by other demands. However, implementing a KM, knowledge management <coughs> strategy, now will actually enable you to meet these demands faster and more effectively. Underpinning all of these challenges is the biggest challenge of them all, I'm still reading from the brochure, <laughs> culture and change management. You need to find a successful way of re-engineering and distributing knowledge to break through old barriers and reach a new plateau of knowledge sharing. 
but how can you instigate such cultural change and where do you begin? Our speakers, the brochure says, have been involved in key projects designed to manage and organize a knowledge sharing culture. Now, knowledge management is a burgeoning discipline and much knowledge management is management of the knowledge that members of an organization share about themselves as an organization. At the same time, knowledge management may be dealing with information produced elsewhere and much technical know-how will fall into this category. The interest is, is in its distribution and consumption. Indeed, need for management arises when people become conscious of the kind of specific information that belongs to specific domains. And of course, we have a name for information at the moment at which it appears to be an already existing specialism, expertise. Expert knowledge has to be dealt with as it, as it comes. For while people's expertise may be endlessly questioned, it cannot be rectified. You can ignore it, choose what you take from it. But a non-expert is precisely one who cannot judge in terms of the quality of the information itself, what can be thrown away and what should be kept. Now, a large part of the research process consists in throwing things away. Blind alleys, dead devices, banal expositions, strained conclusions. The researcher is constantly experimenting with how arguments do or do not fit. It's important to keep open the space ahead for new combinations to form, precisely because of the background of epistemological doubt that drives research in the first place. The researcher seeks certainty, confident that he or she will find new sources of uncertainty, that one research program will lead to another. But to get there, avenues may have to be explored that prove worthless, projects abandoned, theses discarded, only some ideas get taken on, only some books get read. And the dead end comes not from failure to manage information, but from being unable to combine ideas, materials, analyses, and so forth to produce credible outcomes. Much of the activity of research lies in distinguishing between powerful and weak combinations, between what is right and what is wrong, in the light of everything else that is known. The researcher turns into a manager, however, when boundaries of expertise are crossed and the research has to be presented for those who do not share that and everything else. So there's a difference between the goals of research and of knowledge management. Classically, management seeks to reduce uncertainty. Creativity here lies in ensuring the best outcomes for all, and the manager's task may include seeing how everything can be pressed into service. In management terms, everyone could get an A. And because everyone can theoretically get an A, it's mismanagement that is to blame for failure. But the manager then turns into a researcher in weighing up the evidence as to what must be thrown away, that is, what, according to the relevant management model, seems inefficient or superfluous or getting in the way of maximizing performance. So <coughs> what a back-to-front mishmash the RAE turns out to be. It encourages ma academics to be managers of their relations with the outside world when they should be thinking about research, however mediocre or misleading, the paper just get on the publish, and above all, do not throw anything away. <laughs> it encourages something closer to research on what probably should be managed. Let's sort out the organization's quality in relation to our paradigms of excellence, since our paradigms enable us to assess scholarship regardless of the diverse contributions persons or departments make to the local knowledge economy. And I speak from a university that in the name of management is just about to throw away the top teaching department in the country because it did not do well enough in the RAE. Now management is embedded in techniques such as the roving microphone in the recognition space, both of which contain situations that might otherwise be explosive. Management's approach to an uncertain future is to try to protect it from some of the dangers of the present. By contrast with knowledge in a research environment where every failure yields more information, here we come up against the perception, all too real in the economy of business and enterprise, that failure constitutes a risk to the organization and to the firm, including failure to manage knowledge properly. To dampen down risk of organizational failure, 
risk management was seen to be the answer. However, as Mike Power suggests in his new broadside, these days the challenging issue is how to limit the growth of the risk management of everything. Risk management has become a new organisational template, a ubiquitous model for administration, yet it threatens to immobilise institutions and expertise alike. And I quote from him, the risk management of everything reflects the efforts of organisational agents to offload their own personal risk. The result is a potentially catastrophic downward spiral in which expert judgment shrinks to an empty form of defendable compliance. In terms that could almost describe the research model of knowledge creation, we need, he says, a new political and managerial discourse of uncertainty. A new politics of uncertainty would allow professional competence to flourish, and in legitimizing failure, a proportionality of response to erroneous decisions. For at present, he says, the risk management of everything poses major risks to a society in which the most pressing and most unpredictable problems cannot be solved without the effective marshalling of expert knowledge and judgment. In short, a management model of knowledge creation producing information strategic for organisational success is inappropriate as a total response to risk. Far from managing expertise, it runs the risk of displacing it altogether. If what is needed is the effective marshalling of expert knowledge, we have come by another route, back to our party of professionals, rolling up their sleeves and getting down to problem solving. But in the case I want to develop, management has got in there already. Now I hope it's clear that I don't oppose management to research in any totalizing way. I certainly do not suggest that the research model axiomatically creates free spirits and creative thinkers. Rather, each is a point in a particularly Euro-American oscillation between the condition of knowing through investigation, research, and the condition of asking what is to be done with that knowledge, management. What makes us able to look at them apart is how each gets built into institutions and technologies become sedimented in certain kinds of activities. Over the last 50 years, for example, the research university has embodied the practices of research, and here I take on board Brennus's challenge to engage ethnographically with the institutional context in which we work. The practice of cross-disciplinary engagement, canonically taken as interdisciplinarity, is the case that I take up. By contrast with multidisciplinary encounters, aligning different voices, there is a promise of epistemic transfer, that is, of affecting the knowledge base on which one works. <coughs> I refer to interdisciplinarity in the abstract because its most powerful grip lies in the very idea of it. It combines in itself two compelling values. On the one hand is all the creativity in the idea of crossing boundaries, the innovative possibilities that lie in making new connections. On the other hand are the shirt sleeves, the sheer logic of marshalling experts to talk with one another to solve problems, the practical sense of addressing issues that cannot be handled by one approach alone. It is an unbeatable combination. It is to say, there is also a great pull to imagine that disciplinary boundaries can be transcended altogether as in the coinage transdisciplinarity. For rather as existing culture gets in the way of knowledge management, existing disciplines get in the way of interdisciplinarity. An extreme view from Europe, but perhaps articulating a general one, an advisory council for science and technology in The Hague has asserted that among the bottlenecks that hinder the growth of cross-disciplinary research is, and I quote, cultural difference and differences of approach between disciplines. But whereas the knowledge manager would manage cultural change to get reality in line with the vision, the researcher must sustain those other presences, the disciplines, without which the interpolated nature of the new activity would not be visible. It is, of course, perennially interesting to ask why subjects that have been around for a long time suddenly seem of the moment. Why must interdisciplinarity be seen to be on everyone's agenda these days? Why its new visibility? Why explicitly part of the policy of all the UK research councils? 
especially in the natural sciences, regrouping is routine. But the organic regrouping of disciplines is not enough. Effort must also be stimulated. To initiate cross-disciplinary and multidisciplinary initiatives is a stated objective of the Research Council's UK, or at least it was uh, when that was written, the date being 2001. But to what infinitesimal degree? In front of me is the nano-absurdity of micromanagement offered by the extreme case to which I referred. And although it refers to multidisciplinary, I, uh, multidisciplinarity, I, I'm encompassing it to include interdisciplinarity in UK parliaments as well. Anyway, listen to this. Its suggestion is that the Netherlands govern government might intervene by funding more interaction, building up networks, developing comprehensive multi-area research questions, and identifying themes where multidisciplinarity will flourish. It adds suggestions about managing the situation through secondment and selective funding, but these are rather more than suggestions. At bullet point five out of eight, under the heading, several alternatives for developing more comprehensive research questions, we find incorporate compulsory mechanisms into the funding conditions that will ensure that comprehensive research questions are actually formulated and maintained. Compulsory mechanisms. The research question is to be driven by the desire to be multidisciplinary. Themes direct the researcher to problem-oriented types of questions, which then become comprehensive by virtue of many disciplines brought to bear. Ensuring questions are really comprehensive can then be monitored. By now, of course, I'm quoting, the popular maxim is that all good social science is interdisciplinary. This comes from a survey of social science carried out in the States. The date, 1959. We've been here before. Another moment of micromanagement. An important standard for evaluating, for evaluating the quality of a piece of work being the extent of its interdisciplinarity. Government and private organisations alike all pushed social scientists to become more interdisciplinary. Resources and effort was poured into making interdisciplinary research function better. And I'm quoting from 1959, publications, I'm sorry, the study of, publications that championed the maintenance of disciplinary integrity were swamped by the calls for interdisciplinary collaboration, integration, and unification. Interdisciplinary explanations of society displayed what social science could offer the post-war world in terms of useful and practical knowledge that it could bring to bear on pressing problems. Above all, there was a belief in the integration of society and the integration of knowledge. Those who shaped their research with an interdisciplinary problem focus and had broad theoretical questions common to all the social sciences were avant-garde. Clinging to standardised fields was being traditionalist. No accident that Gallison's depiction of the disciplines trading with one another, the shirt sleeves, evoked this period. The point is the way in which it was felt that the new knowledge had to be managed. Now before this period, interdisciplinarity as such was, interdisciplinarity was unlikely to have been labelled as such. But managing integration across the disciplines had its antecedents. And I turn to a recent discussion of the Victorian scientist James Clark Maxwell and his classic 1873 treatise on electricity and magnetism, originally in, intended as a textbook for Cambridge undergraduates. Now, in order to make his exposition clearer, Maxwell divided aspects of his general theory into separate chapters by discipline, but in fact, he made it more difficult. The narrative makes assumptions far beyond any one reader's competence. Um, and I quote from the author of the chapter from which I take this, suddenly the reader is confronted by specialized vocabularies and terms of phrase from electrical engineering, electrical theory, metrology, and higher mathematics. And those who hope to find something akin to Maxwell's overall understanding needed to possess at least a comparable range of skills. Now the Cambridge mathematicians struggled to understand the book in order to teach it to students. And they found it frankly hard going, not least because of the idiosyncratic way 
in which he applied his mathematics. And Maxwell's own lectures were not much use, and it was left to, to diverse college lecturers to try to turn the treatise into a real textbook. The result was a collective activity so that they could pool their skills in puzzling out opaque passages and oblique derivations. And I quote again, what enabled much of Maxwell's project in the electromagnetism to be reconstructed so effectively in Cambridge in the 1870s was the distributed presence of very similar selves among the coaches and college lecturers. Now, this was problem solving in a very direct sense. And insofar as those distributed selves occupied fields of overlapping, if not identical, interests, they could regard one another as having an output in common. In the end, there was something like a collective understanding of electromagnetic field theory. Intelligent management, then, can convert a multiplicity of sources, divided origins, into singular outcomes. But that's not necessarily how research develops. While the teachers forged a joint understanding, they didn't yield their own disciplinary inputs. For they had to be able to discriminate between problems requiring interpretation, errors, and unfinished thinking. The coherent field of theoretical and experimental study envisaged by Maxwell was thus fragmented through pedagogical expediency into separate projects. And the story of whom I'm quoting emphasizes the conservative nature of this retreat into, into known compartments of knowledge. But at the same time, in the 1870s and 1880s, all this work being put into comprehending the treatise placed electrical science at the heart of mathematical <coughs> and experimental physics in the university. A problem is never just solved, its solution may generate combinations of expertise that will not have existed before. You could even say that a paradigm of research growth is that single sources generate divided or multiple outcomes. Now, it was not the idea of interdisciplinarity as such that had to be managed, but rather the intelligibility of the extraordinary combinations on which Maxwell's work rested. They required interpretation. T.H. Huxley was, of course, interpreter par excellence. This takes us back to the 1860s. As you know, his work around that time had been propelled forth, forward by the origin of species, and he became part of Darwin's distributed agency. His, his name, for example, was an assurance of a packed hall, and when his lectures on our knowledge of the causes of the phenomena of organic nature were hurriedly brought out as a slim book, it quickly became a bestseller. Huxley's own expertises, zoology, botany, and general biology, was not trumpeted as interdisciplinary, but he was trumpeting the way everything was related. And by that he meant everything in the organic and inorganic world made up as it is of basic matter that is identical. That organic matter returns at the end of life to the inorganic, he said, is true of every living form, from the lowest plant to the highest animal, including man himself, the difference between highest and lowest simply lying in the complexity of developmental changes, structural forms, and physiological functions. Now the background, of course, makes this provocative. Within the anthropology of the time lay the struggle between those who postulated several origins for human beings and those who sought only one. And what is interesting about this now scandalous division is that it did not endure. And the discipline's divergent origins were suppressed, divergence and diversification being attached to the narrative of what happened afterwards down the stream in what was still in the future. Meanwhile, there were research questions. <coughs> One concerned the perceived similarities on which Huxley was so insistent. For everything that can be related also creates a universe in which everything can be known. The description of affinities in turn involved a search for evidence of a singular undivided ancestry. Diversification was to lie in the future. Now that notion of ancestry was already pared down to a lineal connection. The search was for one distant progenitor, the common parent. Darwin himself, Julian Beer remarks, 
does away with the sexual pairing as an, as an initiating origin, and she says, the originary parental dyad is figured as the one sexually undifferentiated and irretrievable for single progenitor. But the anthropologists who were writing in the 1870s or thereabouts then had a problem to manage the question of affinity in terms of marriage. The facts of human procreation and differentiation of male from female parent posed a problem as to what the originary form of human organization might be. And as you know, doctrines of primitive promiscuity and later exogamy were part of a sequence of solutions from the postulate that sexual differentiation made no difference to the homogeneous nature of social organization to assertions that it served the perpetuation of unified groups. Now, it must be obvious that my presentation of these concerns is not a research finding. Rather, I have managed this account to produce a particular outcome. But mapping a contrast between undivided pasts that look to multiple futures and undivided futures that reconcile multiple pasts, mapping this onto the two models of knowledge creation enables me to cast interdisciplinarity in a particular light. It allows me to specify one way, at least, in which it engages with different representations of growth. For interdisciplinarity has it both ways. It can offer diversity as at once foundational to an enterprise and as innovative. To hope that future combinations will unify what were once distinctly diverse origins, multiple disciplines, speaks of a management model of knowledge creation. A particular outcome is sought. To hope to the contrary that new combinations will divide and proliferate what have once been an origin in common, create new disciplinary possibilities, is closer to a research model. Here the outcomes are indeterminate in their multiplicity. So in the first, diversity is pressed into problem solving. In the second, problem solving generates more diversity. Well, is that all? If this gives you a sense of letdown, perhaps it is that the formula seems to exhaust everything that we might wish to do. To the gift, and the Indian gift in its different forms, let me add another one, the Fijian gift. There is a moment in the course of Fijian gift giving when the giver's side, I'm quoting, <coughs> subjects itself to the gift receiver's evaluation and quietly hopes that the other side will respond positively. Motionless, the giver's spokesman holds the object in front of him until the recipient steps forward and takes it. I quote again, in this moment of hope, the gift givers place in abeyance their own agency or capacity to create effects in the world. What in other contexts may be a process of evaluation that takes place after the event or isn't visible until a return gift is made is here brought forward into the act of handover. So what is this leap into familiar terrain, this jump into a quintessentially anthropological account? Partly, after all these generalities, to engage with the relief of the specific, partly to convey what it feels like being at home in one's discipline. What is quintessentially anthropological is not that this is a Pacific island, or that this account from the mid-1990s talks of an object being handed over that has a long cultural history. Rather, it is that the evocation of the Fijian gift puts this gift alongside many others summons a lineage of, the lineage of theoretical stopping places that no one but an anthropologist would rehearse. And another thing as well, for the ethnographer does not in fact stop at that moment, but goes on to do something with the iconography of gift giving, not quite like anything before. Thinking of its antecedents in anthropological writings gives the Fijian gift its newness. Now the ethnographer of Fiji here is Miyazaki, what interests him is the fact that once the recipients accept the gift, they may immediately deny the importance of gift giving among people and offer the item to God. At the moment at which the giver's hope is fulfilled by the recipients, it is replaced by a second hope that God's blessing will fall on everyone, and this replication is his problematic. 
And it's important here that he goes back to Christina Torren's original insight into the way that Fijian and Christian ritual work together, not as different forms, but as versions of a single form which unfolds in time. This includes the manner in which people cease to emphasize their own actions and deliberately look to others for their response. Fijian participants experience the fulfillment of their hope as the capacity to repeatedly place their own agency in abeyance. Thus the hope, he says, produced in this process surfaces as the replication of a hope fulfilled. And Miyazaki sees a parallel in the anthropologist's hope of an adequate analysis and the possibility of fresh knowledge. So what's this got to do with anything? Well, it's everything to do with creating knowledge, with the difference between management and research models, with origins and outcomes, with interdisciplinarity and the discipline of social anthropology. The Fijian gift contains an unexpected significance in the account given of it. The anthropologist calls it a moment of evaluation. Now, evaluation is simultaneously a management tool and a research tool. Risk assessment is all about evaluating, measuring, judging possible outcomes as our systems of audit and accountability. Evaluation is equally central to the research processes that choose what should be kept and what discarded, that sorts the poor data from the rich. The kind of scrutiny, that kind of scrutiny, is second nature to the researcher, or more accurately, often deploys a primary one, the researcher's disciplinary identity. Disciplines offer frameworks for evaluation, and we call it criticism. Disciplinary criticism has affinities with, but isn't quite the same as the self-evaluation for the purposes of better management. I'm sure managers and researchers acting as managers are told to be critical of themselves in order to improve things. But the point is that the desired outcome is already specified in the goals of the organisation in question. The researcher and managers <coughs> acting as researchers, on the other hand, criticise retrospectively in relation to the canons of their discipline. Discipline is a body of data, a set of methods, a field of problematics, but it's also a bundle of yardsticks, <laughs> that is, already existing criteria for evaluation. Knowing that the canons may be constantly changing and that outcomes are uncertain can be taken as a sign of life, quite as much as the reverse. Disciplines live in the prospect of their own renewal and often do not care too much what form that's going to take. Now it follows that here there is no desired outcome, only the hope that there will be an outcome. I can criticise Mazzaki's concept of the gift, but there's no ideal version to strive for. Rather, the aim of criticism is to multiply the outcomes of any one particular argument. In fact, it begins looking almost like a kind of indigenous interdisciplinarity. Criticism bifurcates. It makes single accounts multiple again. Unitary in its argumentative focus, the lineage summoned by putting most Gregory, Parry, Laidlaw, and so forth alongside Maizaki, speaks to diverse conclusions continuing to fuel debate. More emphatically, disciplines look to disagreement as points of growth. In fact, disagreement serves to overcome one of the problems that Maizaki sees in constructing an anthropological account of the Fijian gift. He observes the temporal orientation of hope to the future that the anthropologist can only deal with by putting hope back into the past through retrospective description. The possibility of describing hope's Perspective momentum is drowned in the knowledge of whether or not it was fulfilled. There's a kind of foreclosure. By comparison, the researchers hope that there will be an outcome to the labours is given impetus through practices of disagreement. For their instruments of self-renewal, the papers they write and the books they generate, allow disagreements to remain unclosed. The disagreement the opening out to, future, to further futures can be left just as that. Indeed, and this is important, criticism is a genre in its own right. I'm not saying anything new here. It simply points to one way in which 
Mike Power's agenda for uncertainty is already built into disciplinary practice. However, there are some interestingly new difficulties in our path. And what makes things difficult these days is precisely the striving after renewal. It's not that anyone outside them is particularly bothered by the fate of disciplines, but rather that the goal for replenishment is knowledge in a commodifiable form as information or evidence, as in evidence-based policy, that can be put to use as the driving ingredient of the knowledge economy. The shirt sleeves, knowledge pressed into the service of problem solving, is the image to which I keep returning. Interdisciplinarity that shows an openness to other ventures and different fields also works as a sign of willingness to subordinate dis disciplinary interests to finding common solutions. Now, under, research re under a research regime, people will be using their expertise instrumentally, as Gallison's scientists imagined themselves. While everything they do has its appropriate disciplinary origin, in the new circumstances, it'll just be bits and pieces that may turn out to be tradable. But under a management regime, it is much more likely that expertise will have a representational status, as though people represented their disciplines as a whole. So sitting around a table at a policy or ethics forum, experts from diverse disciplines will speak as representative <coughs> of their discipline. With no other anthropologist present, it becomes possible to give an anthropologist's view. Plenty of challenges, perhaps, but exit the critic. Passing round the microphone. A multidisciplinary group can, of course, work together with little interest in the backgrounds of one another's contributions. But even if an interest in disciplinary difference is the hallmark of interdisciplinary collaboration, where representatives do indeed reflect on the contributions they're making, even listening for points of resonance, the critic may still be hard to discern. And why? Perhaps we should return to the power of interdisciplinarity to proliferate outcomes and origins alike. And now, and because it's not the critic alone who becomes shy in the face of interdisciplinarity, but so too does the managerial evaluator, and he, is, he or her has been the subject of some comment, um, I shall start there. Because something very interesting happens to evaluation. Interdisciplinarity evoked as a measure of innovation obscures attempts to apply evaluation procedures to itself. And the result, I'm quoting, is the lack of available criteria to assess interdisciplinary work on its own terms. Asked about outcomes, researchers rely on indirect, indirect indicators such as publications or patents. Measures that directly address epistemic dimensions of interdisciplinary work are rarer and much less well articulated. <coughs> in the management view, then, interdisciplinarity runs into some of the problems that bedevil attempts to justify government support for the creative arts in terms of their contribution to public well-being, for instance. What impact do cultural programmes have? Again, attempts at qualitative assessment are tended to focus on the directly observable, for example, surveying participant satisfaction. Can culture, as in cultural programmes, be shown to have an impact on people's lives? It's like asking if interdisciplinarity can demonstrate epistemic effect. How does one show that some difference has been achieved? That's our management model then. Among the reasons why the demonstration is so difficult is perhaps that the single outcome, the effect of the programme, the integrated endeavour, is impossible to measure against its own diverse origins. There's little against which to evaluate the effectiveness of interaction when the whole point was that there was no pre-existing relationship, only diverse starting points, and interaction was always a hope for the future. So can we reverse that sequence and suggest the counterpart in research, criticism, becomes obscured for the opposite reason, that the expectation of multiplying outcomes compromises the ability to criticise. Constructing disciplines as entities with singular origins make criticism possible, but it can't be criticism of the interdisciplinary effort itself. Instead, it seems, interdisciplinary effort would discard those origins, and I re-engage the point that openness to different fields indicates willingness to subordinate disciplinary interests. The single starting point 
can be no measure of the combinations and crossovers that point to future growth. And impatience is the usual reaction. Disciplines simply get in the way, as traditional cultures everywhere are held up as impediments, and all barriers seem obsolete. So it sounds as though it was far too quick to conclude that criticism was a kind of indigenous interdisciplinarity. But I suspect that's partly an effect of the limitations of my models. We've not yet finished with a critic, in fact, or with interdisciplinarity, for that matter. Interdisciplinary collaboration seemed to promise innovation and creativity by means other than criticism. Instead of generating disagreement and multiplying future possibilities from, by comment from within, <coughs> interdisciplinary conversations hold out the hope of fresh combinations and new sources of energy. Hope is still there. Indeed, hope regenerates exactly as Miyazaki argues for the Fijians' constant return to the issues of land compensation. The focus on land <coughs> arises out of their experience of colonization. Repeated efforts are made to present their claims. Yet each new effort requires them putting to one side their knowledge about what happened the previous time. As the ethnographer says, how have these people kept their hope alive for generation after generation, when their knowledge has continued to fail them. It does not matter how successful or otherwise previous attempts have been, people return to the same points of departure. And I gestured towards that in recording the personal war momentum for interdisciplinary research and the mix of management and research models to which we've returned in almost identical terms today. But let's look at the, the, at the researcher's faculty for criticism a bit more closely. It's a social faculty. A further element in the Fijian encounter prompts the thought. In that moment of hesitation, as the gift is given but not yet received, couldn't we say that the giver desires to be divided from the receiver? And couldn't we also say that the, that the capacity that that division reenacts is the very capacity to separate ourselves, not from another, but in the first place, from ourselves. It should be a truism that it is dividing ourselves from ourselves that creates persons as others. In any event, this is a social faculty before it is anything else. Anthropologists divide themselves off from anthropologists, multiply their positions precisely because they have common origins. The same could be said of the whole company disciplines that make up academia and the community in my title to refer to either. Now the concept of division needs teasing out a bit. First, divisions are at work in the way disciplines propagate. They breathe through cleavage, whether by the rational calculation that old categories no longer hold things together, or through acrimonious wranglings that open up rifts. Here division operates the form of multiplication a mode of generating new forms. Second, divisions can be an impetus to colonization. Each may see something of value in the other, which is too appropriate for their own agenda. That is, it already no longer belongs to the other person alone, as my rendering of the Fijian gift takes it away from its location in the ethnographer's <coughs> account. Third, in the kinds of 21st century exhortations to interdisciplinarity we've been considering, Division becomes a sign of failure to communicate, failure to create a wider community, whether that includes the public or other disciplines. And in fact, disciplines are frequently <coughs> accused of failing to cross the divide between esoteric and common knowledge. A frequent rhetorical illusion in government and other public statements merges being able to deal with materials in an interdisciplinary way and being able to communicate to anyone, that is, stakeholders, and so forth. However, the divisions a critic envisages are none of this. Rather, they are seen to be created in the course of interaction itself. Recall the recognition space, the admonition that anthropologists take as their subject matter, the differentiating activity that emerges from inhabiting one world, where categories such as indigenous and non-indigenous are the outcomes of encounters. Suppose, in any case, that the procedures characterizing anthropological investigation are conceptually of the same kind 
as those to be investigated. In what turns out to differentiate people are the radically distinct problems they think they have. By the same token, the critic would have a different relationship to the discourse under scrutiny than the proponent of it. United by interest in a particular work, critic and proponent are not just differentiated by the problems they perceive. Their interdependency means that they are specifically divided from each other by these problems. Whether within persons or between them, the impetus to divide ourselves from ourselves is a social one, and that gives another strand to the critic. When the Fijian gift giver's spokesman fell silent, he placed their agency in the hands of the recipients who would reveal its effectiveness. So, and I'm quoting, they experienced the fulfillment of their hope as the capacity repeatedly to place their own agency in abeyance. Surrender before appropriation. There is, here is hope for engagement. Could we then think of the critic as someone whose willing suspension of agency, a division of self from self, allows him or her to be captured by someone else's work? Critics find themselves drawn into other people's agendas. Now, engagement does not proliferate or multiply. It doesn't look to standards and requires no evaluation. To argue with an idea is to be captured by it. And in this kind of engagement, one can be captured more than <coughs> once. And this is where I see hope for interdisciplinary endeavor. In this area of expertise, the very idea of traversing disciplinary boundaries uses institutional terms to speak of possibilities that lie in being captured by another's concerns. But it also makes visible the interests of those who are, who are identifiably other to the discipline in hand. Engaging one's own interest in other people's agendas, the anthropologist has been here before. In interdisciplinary work, I see a replication of the anthropologist's hope in the ethnographic moment. Each interdisciplinary encounter points to fresh encounter in a terrain only uncertainly mapped, and it's the obviousness of the uncertainty that's important here. The constant shortfall of knowledge that never really gets beyond recognition spaces holds out the hope that one can always re-engage. And that's why I've kept with this one account on Fiji. Whether to agree or disagree, the possibility of re-engagement is ipso facto critical. A new problem is conceived. But there's one caveat. If we think of future engagement predicated upon the hope for it, our two models of knowledge creation will raise their heads. It's a short step to ask how best to manage this or to build such hope into research protocols. And I don't think we should do either. Re-engagement needs to be re-engagement. And following Miyazaki's concern with the distortions of temporality, a matter for the future that the present should leave undefined. Yet how can one not plan ahead? How not make a virtue out of engagement? One way might be by imagining that one has to protect that as though it were knowledge to be protected. Presumably, knowledge best not acted upon is best put into abeyance. So perhaps the answer is not to treat these observations as knowledge at all. Perhaps rather than the faculty for hope, that is hope for engagement, we might just want to say that engagement is a faculty, and this time to land claims, Aboriginal ones, and to a clear interdisciplinary moment. The latest issue of Oceania contains a remarkable piece of ethnographic elucidation. It's a lawyer's commentary on anthropological <coughs> advocacy. Edmund, the lawyer, uh, is concerned that anthropologists realize that once they're in court, they have ceded interpretive space. This is largely an unwilling or unacknowledged surrender. The point is that the roles of expert witness and advocate are procedural and are not open to the anthropologist to define. Rather, he or she will be assigned certain duties of care the court, in demanding, may lay open to dispute where the parties mm -hmm. concerned. For they will seek to deploy the kind of evidence that the anthropologist brings in terms of disputable points of law. The anthropologist, of course, may well look upon the court transcript 
as though it were information collected in an interview subject to the canons of scholarly verification. That is often the basis of their complaints, whereas in truth, judges do not distort anthropological knowledge, for it's not placed before the courts as knowledge in which they need to have any informed interest. And he calls this the legal colonization of anthropology. Yet there is a note of interdisciplinary hope here, couched in an invitation to re-engage, and Edmund quotes an Australian jurist. The last thing I would wish to encourage in humanist witnesses is obsequiousness towards lawyers. There are good social reasons for treating the legal system's normative and adjudicatory authority with respect, but none for endowing it with intellectual authority. Anthropologists, he himself goes on, have an important obligation to publicly criticise legal processes if they feel their work is misunderstood or claimants treated unfairly. And he says, sustained and consolidated criticism of legal rules, procedures and doctrines may find fertile ground among judges and other attentive publics, simply that the law courts are not the place for it. In conclusion, the lawyer asks how anthropologists might respond to, to the terms of their colonization. One response could be to lay out what the claim to intellectual authority would look like. The first step would be to show that the issues at stake have been argued over, fought over even, that while there are huge areas of common ground and shared assumptions in their discipline, for anthropologists to engage one another in profound disagreements is part of their work, is part of getting down to the job. Or more pointedly, that agreement and disagreement must go hand in hand for either to have any intellectual purchase. If they always did it, these days perhaps they need to stop being defensive about it. For they may best serve the role of public critic by being known as critics of themselves. So sustained, yes, not so sure about the consolidation, but if anthropologists know themselves as a community of anything, a community of critics will do very well. <laughs>